All right, so we are live. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the roundtable uh, US Women Strategy and European Strategic Autonomy, fostering a transatlantic debate. Uh, my name is Hugo Mayer. I will chair this roundtable. Um, I'm a research fellow at Sciences Po and the director of the European Initiative for Security Studies, which is a network of European scholars seeking to consolidate a field of security uh, studies in Europe. It's really a great pleasure to chair a roundtable with such distinguished speakers. We'll have uh, Stephen Wall, Professor of International Affairs at Harvard University, Barry Posen, Professor of Political Science at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, Marina Henke, Professor of International Relations and Director of the Center for International Security at Hertie School in Berlin, Mauro Gilli, Senior Researcher in Military Technology and International Security at ETH Zurich, and John Mersheimer, Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago. We were supposed to also have uh, Benedetta Berti, who is currently the Head of Policy Planning at NATO, but she just informed me that she will not be able to join, and given the war in Ukraine, she is understandably extremely busy. And, and as a result, by the way, there's a clear gender imbalance in the round table, but I was informed only this morning, so there was no time to change the composition of the panel. In any case, it's a terrific set of speakers from both sides of the Atlantic. And the goal of the round table is really to build synergies between two central debates in the field of security studies now occurring on the two sides of the Atlantic. In Europe, analysts and scholars disagree on the prospects of a European strategic autonomy, namely the capacity of Europeans to autonomously provide for their own defense with little or US, uh, no US assistance. In the United States, the grand strategy debate revolves around the contrasting positions between the proponents of deep engagement, for whom the US should maintain its security commitments in Europe and elsewhere, and the restrained scholars who argue that Europe is by far the easiest place for the US to pull back from. And despite clear overlap, these two debates have so far largely proceeded in parallel silos. And in light of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which is a major exogenous shock on the European security architecture, this roundtable aims to contribute to advancing the debates on the prospects for an autonomous European defense and for the future of US foreign strategy. Um, the, the idea for this roundtable emerged from exchanges with speakers in this roundtable uh, um, on the central findings of an article that I co-authored with Steve Brooks um, <clears throat> in International Security in 2021 titled Illusions of Autonomy. So what we'll do today is build upon this article to foster a transatlantic conversation on the future of European defense and, and US defense strategy. So I will first outline the core argument of this article and discuss it, the implication of the Russian invasion of Ukraine for the argument of the article. And we'll then have a first round of opening statements, seven, eight minutes each, because we have more time given that Benedetta is not here with us today. Um, we'll then have a second round of three, four minutes, and then we'll open up to the Q&A with the audience. Um, Mauro can be agreed to handle the Q&A. And so if you have questions, please do write them in the chat. And Mauro will then submit the questions to the speakers of the round table. Okay, so um, I'll have a very short um, PowerPoint, which is meant to summarize a core argument of the, can you see the PowerPoint? Not yet. Nope. Not yet. Okay. Are you in the other mode? There's two modes, speakers mode and host mode. I think there's another mode that you have to be in to be able to present uh, mm -hmm. PowerPoint. No, oh, wait, sorry. That. Moderation mode for that. You see the screen share down the bottom, mm -hmm. Hugo? Bottom right. I do, I do. Yeah, there's. I there's clicked on it, but it does not allow the screen share. Yeah, I think I think there was some. I think you had to. Can you see it now? No. no. I, I think to be able to screen share, there's some ridiculous. Uh, there we go. Oh.
Yeah, because I just allowed it, but it's not, you, you don't see it, right? No. Hmm. I'm really sorry for this. I, I am confident you can summarize your arguments clearly without about it. PowerPoint, without the magic of PowerPoint. Yes. <laughs> no, no. Okay, let's more PowerPoint needed. Right. So the the first of all, what do we mean by strategic autonomy? And when we talk about strategic autonomy, we should think of a continuum essentially, which goes from complete strategic dependence on the US to a full strategic autonomy. And full strategic autonomy can be defined as the institutional capacity to independently plan and conduct military operation across the full spectrum of conflict, uh, meaning high intensity military operations like expeditionary warfare, but also territorial defense missions against a nuclear armed adversary. And to have the autonomous capacity to develop and produce the related equipment without the help of the US. Now, the main art, uh, argument of the article we published in International Security in 2021 was that the capacity of Europeans to develop a full strategic autonomy is hampered by two mutually reinforcing constraints, and that's strategic cacophony and capability uh, shortfalls. Uh, strategic cacophony refers to the fact uh, diverging threat perceptions and, uh, um, and um, diverging, sorry, uh, national threat perceptions and therefore diverging national strategic priorities. And to show that, we gathered a lot of evidence, primary sources on the past five years, showing how different countries in Europe have different rankings of threat perceptions and strategic priorities. And now, of course, the war in Ukraine, because of Russia's invasion in Ukraine, has heightened European threat perceptions of Russia. And I'm sure other people on the panel are going to make this point too. And Putin, in fact, has been more effective than any US pressure or threat of withdrawal in spurring European concerns. We've seen a big policy change in Germany, uh, debates on whether Sweden or Finland should join NATO, and tough EU sanctions on Russia. But I'll make a couple of points on this, which is, um, European strategic cacophony cannot be written off because of what happens in Ukraine. First of all, higher security concerns vis-a-vis -vis Russia are relative to the past, which is a low bar. For many countries, Russia was not even a security concern before the war in Ukraine. Secondly, there have been enduring, there are still enduring divergences in threat prioritization and diverging strategic priorities among Europeans. Will uh, countries in Western or Southern Europe now consider Russia as their number one security concern rather than instability in the Mediterranean, that's unlikely. And Italy, for instance, just reaffirmed the centrality of the Mediterranean in its defense planning rather than Russia. And so countries may increase their contribution to NATO eastern flank, but compared to the past, but the ranking of strategic priorities is unlikely to change. And then finally, the sanctions are different than defense policy. So European unity in um, imposing economic sanctions does not mean they will unite militarily. Defense planning is quite different from uh, than imposing sanctions. And so the bottom line is you see rising concerns over Russia across Europe compared to the past, but diverging threat assessments and diverging ranking of strategic priorities persist. And then, so the second constraint we identified is um, uh, severe defense capacity shortfalls. Uh, Europeans select the basing weapon systems for conventional defense and deterrence, they have very profound shortfalls in more complex systems like C4ISR. Um, the, the role of the US as the hegemon in NATO means that the US withdrawal would amplify the collective action and coordination problems within NATO. And, and if the US were to withdraw, it's, it's likely to affect being on the permanent command and control of another European country for defense and deterrence. And you also have all, all the fragmentation of the European defense industries on both the supply and the demand side. You know, so how are we to understand these constraints in light of the war in Ukraine? Well, first of all, the war is not over. So it's too soon, but it is, sorry?
I heard you. Maybe weaker than many analysts. I think you go, you're breaking up. You're breaking up. You've been breaking up, Hugo. Are, are you are, are you close to your Wi-Fi antenna? Sorry? Ah, oh, you can't hear me. It, it, we've had a problem. Yeah, yeah, I am. But can you hear me now? It's better, but uh, but you were... Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. I hope you can hear me now. All right, but so to tell essentially um, the extent, the overall assessment of Russian military capabilities, a lot of shortcomings are in part due, in part due to bad planning and assumption of a quick victory. We know that Russia has capability that is not employing, and it's unlikely that Russia would have the same optimistic assumption and make the same mistakes in a conflict with NATO member. Uh, secondly, European responses to the war in Ukraine have unfolded under the U.S. nuclear and conventional umbrella. And the key point is that replacing this U.S. conventional and nuclear umbrella would require a very long time and huge investments. Also because the U.S. retains 70 to 80 percent of the capabilities in the alliance. And a final point, which is often overlooked, is that defense expenditure in Europe remains the prerogative of European nation states, not of the EU. And therefore, given the fragmentation of European defense industries, when Europeans increase their defense spending, historically, they've often invested in diverging type of equipment. And so increasing national defense spending without first solving Europe's strategic cacophony may well deepen Europe's strategic fragmentation. And to conclude, defense autonomously as soon as possible and without the US. And certainly Putin has pushed Europeans away from the wishful thinking world of the 1990s and 2000s. But there can be no European strategic autonomy without the autonomous European capacity for conventional and nuclear defense and deterrence. And as long as collective defense and deterrence cannot be guaranteed by Europeans without the US, there is no real strategic autonomy. And this is why it's so important to analyzing the constraints and the challenges on a European strategic autonomy. And so bottom line, we must, I believe, all be more realistic regarding how and when Europeans can become fully autonomous. So thanks a lot. I very much look forward to all your reactions. And Steve, the floor is yours. Okay, <clears throat> great. Well, it's a pleasure to be able to talk with everybody this morning. Um, the central question before us is whether Europe can take primary responsibility for its own security or whether it has to stay forever dependent primarily on American protection. And as Hugo has just summarized very nicely, uh, last year they published a, this lengthy article arguing the latter, saying Europe basically can't defend itself. Um, and they made three claims, which he's also summarized nicely. Uh, first, that European defense capabilities were so deficient it would take forever or at least a decade or more for them to be able to defend themselves. Um, second, uh, related to that, that Russia's military was actually a lot more capable than comparisons of defense expenditures suggested. So, you know, NATO Europe might spend three to four times what Russia spent every year, but Russia got a lot more bang for its rubles. Uh, and then finally, they argued that Europe's ability to balance Russia was fatally undermined by different strategic priorities, which they termed strategic cacophony. And they based this on a survey of European elites, which I think did show a considerable, though not complete, difference of views among different European countries. Now, as some of us pointed out back then, each of those claims was debatable. Uh, in our view, Steve and Hugo had understated Europe's military potential, overstated how long it would take to build it up, and exaggerated Russia's capabilities. And some of us also questioned whether a survey of European officials that was taken with the American defense umbrella firmly in place and no imminent danger on the horizon, whether that told you very much about how Europe, Europeans would think or act if the umbrella were removed or if a clear and present danger arose. Uh, for, unfortunately for world peace, we don't have to debate this counterfactual. Uh, Vladimir Putin ignored every human subject regulation in the books and has arranged a natural experiment for us. Um, and I think it's actually relatively rare that a scholarly article gets subjected to a real world test quite so quickly. Um, 
So first, the war reminded us that Europe's latent defense potential is far from trivial. It has advanced defense industries. It produces arms that are already helping Ukrainians, such as the NLAW anti-tank missile, which is a joint Swedish-British production, the British Star Street ground-to-air missile. Um, and furthermore, if Europe has to build up capabilities, U.S. defense industries are quite eager to sell uh, weapons like the Lockheed Martin F-35s that Germany has already announced it's going to buy. Uh, second, far from demonstrating fearsome military capabilities, I think the invasion of Ukraine has shown that Russia is much less capable uh, than Steve and Hugo claim. Remember, this is a war that Russia had months, if not years, to plan, and it's been a debacle on multiple levels. Uh, it's not just that they were overly optimistic. I think there's lots of evidence now that the combination of corruption and skimming and inept leadership, not to mention poor performance by conscript troops, leaves Russia with much less capability than its rubles ought to have bought. Uh, this is the kind of thing that Caitlin Talmadge describes well in her book, The Dictator's Army. It's what you often get from an army where loyalty is prized more than competence and where corruption is endemic throughout the entire society. But I think the claim that Europe's capabilities are a lot better than its defense expenditures suggested or that it poses a threat that Europe can't handle with a bit more effort isn't uh, nearly as persuasive anymore. And then finally, um, the idea of European strategic cacophony, I think, turned out to be something of an illusion. Now, there's no question there were disagreements about security a year or so ago when different nations of Europe all faced somewhat different problems and tended to emphasize the ones that were most salient to their particular situation. But once Europe was faced with an unmistakable act of aggression that exceeded everyone's expectations, they reacted pretty much as balance of power theory, or if you'll indulge me, balance of threat theory would lead you to expect. They announced increases in defense spending. They're funneling military aid to Ukraine despite the risks of escalation. They've agreed to far-reaching economic sanctions, even though this has serious costs for them. Countries like Poland and Hungary have stopped feuding with Brussels. Viktor Orban has broken off his bromance with Putin. In short, these earlier differences about priorities vanished or at least declined enormously as soon as Europeans realized all-out war in their neighborhood was still a possibility and that hard power still mattered. And even pacifist Germany seems to have gotten the memo. Now, your, your American diplomacy, what you might call alliance leadership, played some role in this process, but I think it's striking how rapidly Europe responded and how little effort it took the Biden administration to get people on board. This is very different than the situation, say, when we invaded Iraq in 2003. Germany had resisted American pressure to stop the Nord Stream pipeline for years. Russia ended that policy in a couple of weeks. Um, it's also worth noting that Europeans have growing doubts about the U.S. commitment. You know, what if Trump comes back? And the Biden administration's made it clear that there are limits to how far it's willing to go here. So all in all, it seems clear to me that Europe is increasingly willing to translate its enormous power potential into a defense capability that leaves it less dependent on the U.S. going forward. So the bottom line for me is that Europe can, in fact, take care of its security problems if given reason to do so and some time to get ready. Uh, those of us in the restraint camp are not saying that the United States should leave NATO overnight. This has to be a gradual transition process. But because China is a far greater geopolitical challenge to the United States than Russia is, it's time to move towards a new division of labor where Europe takes primary responsibility for its own defense. And the United States serves not as first responder, but as essentially the defender of last resort. And I think Vladimir Putin has shown us that this is both desirable and feasible. So I give Hugo and Steve credit for writing a provocative article that staked out a clear position, provoked a very useful debate. Uh, most of us have written articles that didn't stand the test of time, and I could give you a list of mine. So that's nothing to be embarrassed about. I think writing something that turns out to be wrong helps us uh, as a field advance, and it's certainly preferable to writing something trivial or refusing to take a clear position. Uh, Hugo and Steve have both written serious works of lasting importance 
Uh, but I think this article is not one I would double down on defending too strongly. Let me stop there and I will look forward to the rest of the conversation. Okay, thanks a lot, Steve. And I'll cede the floor immediately to Barry. So I'm going to keep my remarks sort of simple here um, and ask what does the Russia-Ukraine war tell us about NATO, Europe's autonomous military capacity to defend against Russian aggression. And of course, the usual caveat supply here, uh, we're, you know, the fog of war lies heavy over um, uh, Russia and Ukraine. And uh, as one scholar once observed, truth is the first casualty of war. And uh, it's pretty clear that neither the Russians nor the Ukrainians really want outsiders to have a full picture of what's going on. Uh, the Western media has been basically a, a semi-official arm of the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense as far as public relations is concerned. So we, we don't really have an entirely objective uh, a, a picture of, of, of what's happening on the Ukrainian side. Um, I'm going to allude to the article that I wrote in Survival, which uh, Stephen and Hugo took the opportunity to to uh, use as a, a, a foil uh, and just return to some of those arguments and ask what does the present Russia-Ukraine war um, tell us, All right. Um, so the basic argument has been that the Russian military is bigger, more capable, or more technologically sophisticated than the Europeans. I think this is the argument that, that um, Hugo and, and Steve made in, in their piece. And I think the evidence of the actual war suggests otherwise, at least the evidence we have. Uh, in the articles that I wrote, I did a simple force ratio analysis, which showed that under conservative assumptions, Europe was able to generate sufficient force to mount a spirited defense along the eastern borders of NATO, with the caution that I have long believed that the Baltics are in a military sense indefensible, whether or not the Americans are in the war or not. Uh, and that's just a problem that NATO took on when it decided to take on the Baltics. And it's always going to be... A, a problem, right? And all, the other caveat being that European militaries obviously have some readiness issues that require focused attention. Historically, in the United States, readiness problems could be solved in short order, and I'm guessing that Europe's readiness problems could be solved in short order, too. Now, the article I wrote was an error on several matters. Uh, on four critical matters, I overestimated Russian capabilities and underestimated NATO-European capabilities. Uh, I argued that current Russian force structure, like the old Soviet force structure, was too lean on logistics and command and control, and thus I slightly discounted the forces that Russia could support at the Polish border. I almost surely discounted them too little, as we can see that the Russians have rather serious logistics issues fighting much closer to home. It's also apparent that the Russian command and control apparatus, down to the level of its combat units, right, is leadership lean. Only this can explain how many Russian senior officers have been killed uh, in implementing no particular tactical system whatsoever. And only this can explain why so many Russian units seem to have fought with no particular tactical system whatsoever. Even the basic tactics that I have in my shelf full of Cold War American intelligence manuals on how the Russian military fights seems to have been ignored by the Russian military in this fight. So it's really quite striking. We're not talking about gigantic high-level command and control problems here. We're talking about combat at the level of the, of the regiment and the battalion. Um, I argued then that NATO European states have large numbers of infantry units, and brigades that are quite useful in urban, ex-urban and forested terrain, even against armored units, and that those NATO European units, of which there are many, should be counted as viable contributors to a European defending force in the East. I discounted their value somewhat in my analysis in deference to my critics. I should not have discounted their value at all. It is apparent that said infantry armed with modern anti-armor weapons are pretty deadly against mechanized forces. Um, I ar argued in the piece, essentially assumed that modernized European armor from that generation, the late Cold War generation, is at least as good as modernized Soviet Russian armor. I should have argued, as we argued during the Cold War, that NATO equipment is probably qualitatively superior. It's apparent that Russian tanks and armored fighting vehicles are, as they have, were proven in 1967, 1973, and 1982 Israeli wars, as well as in the two U.S.-Iraqi wars, it's been basically demonstrated that these armored fighting vehicles are flaming coffins. They're more dangerous to the people in them than they are to the people that they're fighting. 
right? And this has been shown over and over and over again, and it's still true. Um, I also suspect but cannot prove that Russian artillery and tank ammunition is still, as it was during the Cold War, manufactured to very low safety standards, which makes their combat vehicles even more dangerous to their passengers. This is what accounts in part for the fact that you're seeing Russian armored vehicles that are not just damaged, but are simply blown to pieces with everybody inside them incinerated. Uh, finally, a word about military personnel. I more or less treated European and Russian military units as equal in training, experience, and tactical acumen, accepting the arguments by those who specialize in studying the Russian army that the Russian army has pulled together a significant number of long-service troops comparable to those in European armies. Uh, even at that time, had I done a closer examination of the Russian military personnel system, as it's been discussed, and ex that examination would have yielded the insight that Russian combat units are largely a hodgepodge of conscripts in training, conscripts with some training, conscripts paid or coerced to stay on a year or two, and small numbers of actual long service professionals. And the units that Russia has sent to this war, which encompass nearly all the available trained maneuver battalions in the Russian army, have not showed very well, in part, I suspect, because of their heterogeneous personnel system. And that's a problem that the Russians simply have no solution to. You get what you pay for, right? And uh, the, the reason, you know, the, 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 the dollar spending figures look so skewed is in part because the Russians are getting bargain basement personnel and bargain basement personnel perform like bargain basement personnel. Uh, we turn out to the intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance issue, which uh, Steve and Yugo talk about in their, uh, in their piece. It's apparent that Russian capabilities are pretty mixed. Their intelligence on the initial dispositions of the Ukrainian ground and air and air defense forces appears not to have been very good. They had months and months and months to generate this intelligence. They overlooked some targets, missed some targets, and hit a good many false targets. These problems, given their proximity to Ukraine, their familiarity with the existing stock of military bases and factories, and their very plausible human intelligence assets does not speak well for their collection capabilities nor for their analysis or assessment capabilities. Their missiles themselves appear either to have suffered from inherently faulty guidance systems or from the effects of jamming or countermeasures, or simply from basic reliability problems. We should add to this the information that has emerged with the discussion of sanctions about the extent to which Russia relies on imported electronics components for its security sector, which we know extends to their reconnaissance satellites, about which you guys talk quite a lot. Uh, one wonders the extent to which their collection and communication assets were compromised by this dependence is probably the way that uh, the Stuxnet attack was done against Iran. And I'm imagining that, um, that, that that Russia really can't rely on all these electronics. And they're certainly going to have a problem when they go to replace expended munitions and fix damaged vehicles if they can't import more electronics. This is a, they would have this identical problem if they were at, at war, if they were at war with, you, with, um, with Europe. And by the way, this... Dependence on imported components suggests that this whole um, uh, uh, kind of leisure to man of comparing uh, Russian spending of purchasing power parity needs to be revised. Big chunks of the Russian military clearly are acquired on international market, international market prices, right? So PPP is not a reliable indicator and shouldn't be used, right? I, I think that not, neither should the, you know, should, should, should simple exchange rates. We need some other way to figure out what the inputs are, but what we're using is not good. Uh, the air war suggests there are serious Russian capabilities with, you know, sort of advanced military operations. It's striking that Russia has not established a greater margin of air superiority over Ukraine, especially given their, you know, raw numerical superiority. Uh, you know, basic Manchester Square law <laughs> could tell you that they should be doing better. Uh, their missile-based uh, air defense suppression campaign, to the extent that there was one, seems to have largely failed versus uh, Ukrainian ground-based SAMs and surveillance radars. They've been unable to defeat the Ukrainian Air Force in the air, destroy it on the ground, or deny it the use of its airfields. And it's implausible that the Russian Air Force would do better hundreds of miles to the west against Western European SAMs and fighters. So there's a little doubt as far as conventional war is concerned that Europe can defend itself. The evidence from this crisis does show, as we already know, that the Europeans would much rather have the U.S. defend them. I don't deny that. I mean, the crisis shows the Europeans would like things to go on the way they they have been, and this is no surprise to several people on this panel, which is a surprise is why so many people in the United States seem to want it this way. Okay, thanks a lot, Barry. Um, Marina, the floor is yours. 
We can't hear you. She's frozen. I think it was Marina. Yeah. Yeah, you're frozen, Marina. Frozen, Marina. Your Wi-Fi is not cooperating with you or this Rube Goldberg software that they bought for the system. Okay. <laughs> No, we can't hear you. Your yeah. mic is off. Hi. Lower left side of the screen. Uh, yeah. Mic. Your mic is off. All together. So maybe we move forward, Marina. John, John, we can't hear you either. The, apparently, the, what, there have been some problems the in order <clears throat> other pounds, and then go to Marina. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Indeed. So, Marina, we'll get back to you, uh, hoping you'll solve your <clears throat> technical issues. And um, so, Mauro, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. great. So, at least one out of three. So, well, thanks for the invitation, Hugo, and thanks, everyone, for the interesting insights. I'm going to echo some points that Barry made, uh, even though I have a more careful uh, look. Namely, I think, so... First of all, it's fair to say we all overestimated Russian capabilities. This, as far as I know, few people predicted what we have seen so far. And along the same lines, most people underestimated Russian aggressiveness, say for maybe our Eastern European friends, all my kind of Polish or Baltic colleagues clearly pointed. But other than that, most people underestimate the Russian aggressiveness. And along the same lines, most people me included, underestimated European response. This goes along the lines of what Steve was mentioning. Uh, this being said, I think it's fair to say that it's still very early to draw any conclusion. Uh, the points, the, the information we have point to clear uh, kind of capability shortfalls within Russia, but there's also a lot that we do not know. Uh, so I've seen a video of Ukrainian artillery shilling and hitting very well camouflaged uh, Russian uh, outposts. And clearly that points to the capability to do detect, identify, geolocate the long range uh, enemy positions. Something we have reason to believe that Ukraine by itself does not possess. And these points to what um, Barry was mentioned, it is the problems of the Russian Air Force. So to me, that is the most surprising case and one that warrants caution, namely the fact that Russia so far has not actually been able to not just kind of secure air control, but also to employ extensively his Air Force raises more questions than it answers. Namely, uh, we do know the stingers we have provided Ukraine are not sufficient by themselves to scare jets, just like oh, you cannot fly them with altitude. So this begs the question, how come Russian uh, jet fighters are so scared of entering uh, Ukrainian airspace and carry out their missions? Um, we don't know. Maybe they are very well advanced, uh, kind of, uh, sorry, maybe they are very well uh, aware of uh, Ukrainian air defense capabilities. But this is another question because Ukraine mostly has Soviet-made or Russian-made S-300 and similar systems that are Russian production. So for Russia, uh, just logically, should not be too big of a problem to jam or to spoof this system, or at least to figure out how to uh, degrade them. That this not, has not happened kind of raises some further questions. We do not know what, has, what is going on. Maybe Western countries have been providing long-range uh, detection and information to Ukrainian air defense systems, maybe using... AWACS, maybe using Carpatians as a kind of uh, exploiting an altitude to detect uh, aircraft also when flying at 
uh, low altitude, uh, but we do not know. Same reason, we don't know why Russian aircraft so far has engaged uh, Ukrainian aircraft at short range. This is even more puzzling. So the U.S. has had the cap capacity to uh, of beyond visual range, or in any case, long range detection, identification, uh, and engagement of enemy aircraft since the 70s that Russia has not been able to shoot down those few Ukrainian Su-27s or MiG-29 is really, really surprising. And I would not be able to make any conjecture. I mean, we do not have data. Maybe this points to massive capability shortfalls. Maybe we have to conclude that Russia is even weaker than we are thinking it is. But as, until more data is available, it's impossible to, uh, to derive any meaningful conclusion. Um, then another aspect I would like to touch upon. Ugo, do I have more time or am I already out? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. One more minute and I'll finish. Um, the same reason I would wait to uh, kind of draw conclusion on European unity. So this is what Steve was mentioning. That is the response by European countries has surprised me as well as I think most Europeans. But I would not bet that this is going to be long lasting. Uh, for a couple of reasons, uh, mostly domestic politics, that is, uh, several European countries, mostly in the south, have awful economic performance I've had for the past 10 years. Uh, the two years of COVID have further killed a significant part of their economic activities. Now, the effects of sanctions, especially in terms of customers as well as suppliers, are going to have further effects. I don't think it's going to take too long for many key uh, constituencies in several European countries to start kind of protesting these kind of measures and start to ask more kind of an open uh, response to, to Russia. And the moment this starts, some European countries are going to start drifting away from the, the response. Along the same lines, I mean, I'm from a country, Italy, that had a very pro-Russian government until two years ago. And those forces that were very pro-Russian still are now supporting a different government. But so I interpret the current government more of an exception than as a role. For the first time in a, my whole life, I'm hearing Italian media speaking well of the U.S. This is absolutely like unusual to me. And I don't think it's going to last very long. So totally agree with Steve that uh, the European countries have all united uh, in response to the, the war, but I do not bet that this is going to be long lasting. One last point, uh, a key problem for European countries is the recruitment retaining of skilled personnel. I think this is, Hugo, you and Steve uh, uh, mentioned in your article, this is a big, big problem that clearly is uh, not kind of the US doesn't face, at least not in this magnitude. Okay, I'll stop here. Sorry if, if I went too long, I have some more points I'll address them later. Great. Thanks, Mauro and Marina. Yours. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Fixed? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, well, first, uh, good to see you all. It has been a while. Um, second, I'm having now my German hat on because I'm, uh, you know, ever since the pandemic started, I'm based in Berlin. I left uh, Chicago. Uh, John, I'm missing it a little bit, but I'm sure it's still pretty cold. So weather is nicer over here. But in my uh, remarks, I also want to provide a very distinct German perspective because I think the linchpin of this entire European strategic autonomy is German. And um, so, you know, like I will give you a um, kind of a, an account of uh, my uh, last couple months here in uh, Berlin. And let me start by saying that until February 23rd, 99% of the German elite, including the current government, was absolutely convinced that Russia would not invade. Absolutely convinced. They couldn't really provide an explanation what the 190,000 troops were doing at the border, but there was an absolute conviction that there would not be a, an invasion. It was, you know, they want to bargain. Maybe it's just about the Donbass. But it went through and through. I heard in a all sorts of uh, fora that um, U.S. intelligence was flawed. Of course, it's flawed. It was uh, flawed in Afghanistan. It was flawed in Iraq. So once again, we have um, a situation where we cannot fully trust um, the Americans. So 
What is, uh, you know, important for you to know um, that the German government that came to power earlier this year is a, a coalition government of uh, the Social Democratic Party. And so this is the party that also opposed the Iraq war. And that's quite important because there's a direct connection between this kind of, uh, you know, kind of critical attitude toward the United States and their experiences that they have collected back in 2002, 2003, when they were the last time the leading force in German government. And then the Green uh, Party and the Liberal Party, more importantly, the Green Party, who is in the uh, foreign office, uh, you know, being critical overall of, of anything that is uh, secured in defense. So very uh, briefly, going back to this Iraq notion, because it's so fundamental, uh, back in 2002, back in 2003, when uh, famously Chancellor Schroeder at the time opposed the Iraq war, uh, the dependence, uh, so or at least like the, the, you know, like the degree of dependence on Russian oil and gas, uh, you know, was the groundwork was um, laid because the interpretation back in the day was we will be, so the Germans will be excluded from a, a Middle East that will be, you know, more or less controlled by the United States. And so we have to find alternative sources. And of course, you know, it was very handy. Putin uh, was in the anti-U.S. coalition alongside, of course, uh, Jacques Chirac. So Schroeder, uh, Girac, and uh, Putin, and you all remember, my students here do not remember, but I know you all remember, uh, this was the famous uh, anti-Iraq war coalition um, back in the day. German um, party elites are very stable. So, you know, uh, once you are uh, in some kind of position in the government, you stay on. So it's not like kind of a revolving doorway, go back to the private sector or to academia here. You know, once you are a member in the uh, Social Democratic Party, you, you move from, you know, one position to the next. And that's why, for example, the chief of staff of um, Schroeder uh, is now the president of Germany. That's uh, Steinmeier. And the secretary general of the Social Democratic Party, uh, Klingbeil, was, you know, like his immediate assistant back in 2003. So for them, you know, like that is a very deep seated conviction that, you know, you can deal with Putin, you can deal with Russia and German Russian ties are very, very important and very strong. Now, all of this, yes, changed on February 24th. Uh, I was in... Um, you know, various, uh, again, uh, meetings where I had, where I saw the faces of some of these uh, people that I just uh, mentioned, and they were genuinely shocked. Uh, they were shocked because they couldn't believe that they had misread Putin to such a degree. But what I think is even more important, uh, there were NATO briefings, and, you know, some of you uh, might remember, but in the very first hours and the very first day, it was not clear what would happen. Uh, it was unclear whether the Ukrainian would actually be able to resist. And there was a real probability that Putin uh, could take Kiev in, you know, a couple, couple days. And in, in this uh, scenario, so we are talking now um, Thursday, Friday after the invasion, uh, Germany got the news that uh, Putin uh, might, you know, be on such a, a trip of uh, kind of uh, conquest and might be, you know, full of hubris and he might move further. Um, use, you know, like a walk in the park, uh, just uh, take Ukraine and then move towards uh, Moldova and, you know, maybe eventually even then um, reach uh, Germany. And then like a very quick assessment was made uh, of, you know, like what are actually Germans defense capable in this particular moment. And, you know, now I'm, I'm quoting because the German defense staff basically said, we don't even have the defense capabilities, the air defense capabilities to protect where the chancellor lives right now. So the chancellery, and some of you know, very big building in the middle of Berlin, nor the Bundestag, so the parliament. And this was a real, real shock. Again, uh, Chancellor uh, Schultz, who is the uh, chancellor since uh, February, or since uh, January, sorry, he's not somebody who is very familiar with the military. He was always in his entire career very much focused on economics and uh, finance. And he couldn't believe that, you know, Germany was not even capable of defending, you know, the house where he currently lives. So as you all know, then just two days later, um, a pretty remarkable speech happened. Uh, and this is the speech when he announced that there would be a hundred billion uh, defense fund that there would be, which would be enshrined in the German constitution, which is also quite remarkable. In essence, it means that nobody can change it. Uh, so it's very hard. You need to have a double majority to, to, um, to change it. And so, you know, for future governments, uh, 
you know, to get this majority is quite uh, uh, complicated. Then, of course, the promise of the 2% defense spending. And you need to know that average German defense spending so far has been 0.3% of German GDP. And, you know, all sorts of other things were just like thrown out of the window. Um, Steve already mentioned, uh, so the F-35 purchase was very uh, quickly was decided. It was decided that Germany will um, uh, purchase armed innovation, go figure, with, with um, Israel because they're thinking about Germany. It was actually, actually we have a bet right now, talking about an iron drone. Uh, uh, adopting a very Because I think on the one hand, am I the only one who's not pretty, 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 is uh, I think that there's a, real, a sense of uh, fear Marina, the law. To, and that they need to have any six do something up eight percent of Germans. The Ukraine crisis might escalate. Look at opinion point, and that there might be believe still be um, even a third war. So there's a real, real sense of think in this sense. Germany will not just revert and go back on this. You have big German companies. Mm. Run. It's not just a couple of months, and then you're going back. I was. Is Moscow. Yeah, the sound is breaking, Marina. And also, big other German just completely shut the for the. As you know, as well, yeah. we're not just. It's like it's long, in, long wheels. so there are real there are real calculations made and those substitute in any kind um, and a, a business arrangements with yeah, Marina is breaking we really can hear you real um, the big question of course and this I don't is, think she can hear you. you know, what will happen? This is like, mm -hmm. and so, European or go uh, American. That's the big not being said. That thing. So we're having some IT problems. Marina, you froze again. Maybe when you reconnect, you can connect without the video. <coughs> might be easier because otherwise like for two or three minutes we had the audio breaking can you hear us yeah so we're having some technical issues no marina frozen again so marina maybe you want to Get out of the virtual room and, and come back and uh, uh, hoping this will solve the problem. In the meantime, I suggest we move forwards. Um, waiting, Marina solves the IT issues. Yeah. So let's wait one second and Marina comes back in the virtual room. There we go. Um, there we go. Can you turn your mic on, Marina? Yes. 
and I will probably not reach on the camera if there is a what band problem. Marina? So we are being unlucky with the um, IT connections, I guess. One minute of patience. Then is back. What's yeah, Marina, you there? No. Okay. Marina? Yes. Maybe if you turn the video off, it's going to be easier to hear you. Marina? Can you hear me? No. I just think she has a terrible this connection. Is, mm, yeah, I think. And I hear that there are other yeah, panels having troubles with the AT. So let's, okay. So jo Marina will join back. There she is. So Maybe try to talk without the video. Yes. This is our best bet. It's morning. Sorry for this. These are uh, unexpected technical uh, issues. <clears throat> we probably ought to just go okay, on. Try... Yeah, exactly. Let's move. Let's try once more, and if it doesn't work, we'll move to later. Now. Yes. So oh, I will just move up to John. So indeed, indeed absolutely, John. Let's let's move to you, and hoping that Medina can solve the IT issue in the meantime. John. Okay. Thank you, Hugo. Uh, uh, I enjoyed the piece, even though I disagreed with it in all sorts of ways. Let me just I start by. Well. <laughs> Should we hang on for Marina? Is she coming? Marina, can you hear us? I can. I don't think so. We, we can't oh. hear you hardly at all. We, can, we can't hear you. So I, I'll just... Can, Marina, I'm going to talk, and then if you connect with us after I'm done, you can come in and finish your comments, okay? Uh, so let me start at 120,000 feet and talk about how I see this piece in terms of the big picture. What Hugo and Steve want is they want the United States to stay in Europe and pursue a policy of deep engagement. Uh, and what they fear is that restrainers and people like Donald Trump uh, and various strategic imperatives like the need to pivot to Asia, all of this will cause the United States to leave Europe. Uh, they just don't see our commitment to Europe as being very firm. Uh, and furthermore, if we leave, we meaning the Americans leave Europe, 
uh, the Europeans won't be able to deal with the Russian threat by themselves. And the Russian threat is the only threat that they can ginny up that justifies concern about security. So it's about the, about the Russian threat. And that's their great fear. Of course, we didn't leave. We stayed. And we pursued engagement. And this is most evident in the case of Ukraine, because when their article was published in 2021, uh, and in fact, for the seven years before that, the key issue uh, regarding deep engagement uh, and the American uh, European policy was bringing Ukraine uh, into NATO. Uh, and not only did we stay and continue to pursue deep engagement, but it all blew up in our face. Uh, and we now have a full-blown disaster in Ukraine. Uh, and we're in this remarkable situation where people are actually talking about the possibility of nuclear war. Who would have ever thought that in the year 2022, we would be seriously talking about the possibility of nuclear war in Europe? But anyway, that's the big picture. Now, to focus a bit more on their argument, I think what's very interesting is that they were wrong, I think, on two issues. Uh, they were wrong to fear that we would leave Europe. There was no threat of us leaving Europe. And second, their fears about the Russian problem are misguided. Now, let me just talk about leaving Europe. Uh, the United States in 2008, uh, at, at the famous Bucharest conference, uh, NATO conference, said that Georgia and Ukraine would become part of NATO. This was a major league commitment, and it meant we were going eastward. The Russians weren't coming westward. We were going eastward. We means the United States. The United States foisted the decision to include Ukraine and Georgia on the Europeans, especially the Germans and the French. So we were deeply committed in 2008. Then in 2014, you had this major crisis over Ukraine. It started on February 22nd, 2014. And the question is, what did the United States decide to do? We decided to double down. We didn't decide to go home, right? There's no danger of us going home. This is Imperial America. There's all this talk about Imperial Russia. I'm sorry. Get your adjectives right, ladies and gentlemen. This is Imperial America. We weren't going home. You think Barry Posen, Steve Walt, and John Mearsheimer really matter? We're pimples on the hiney of humanity in the United States, right? Donald Trump, you know, Donald Trump, he came in, he hated NATO, right? He wanted to jump in bed with Vladimir Putin, uh, and he wanted to pivot to Asia. His instincts were basically right, by the way. Uh, but he was beaten back by the blob. It wasn't even a fair fight. He's the one who, in December 2017, decided to arm the Ukrainians. This is a really smart policy, right? You know where that landed up, right? So the whole idea that we would leave Europe and abandon deep engagement was not a serious argument. And oh, by the way, this article was published in early 2021. Joe Biden moved into the White House in early 2021. There's no president in recent history more deeply committed to Ukraine than Joe. He is deeply committed to Ukraine. Uh, so we weren't leaving. Then there's this whole argument that you folks have about Russia being a big threat. Now, Barry and Steve Morrow uh, and Marina, to the extent we could hear her, they were all making it clear that this threat was overblown. And the focus was mainly on capabilities. And they're, of course, correct. But I want to say a few, word about, few words about intentions. There is zero evidence that Vladimir Putin was interested in any serious way in recreating the Soviet Union or the Soviet Empire or building a greater Russia. 
Now, I understand in the West today that this is the mantra that dominates the discourse. But there's no evidence that he said that this was a feasible enterprise, right? There's no question that in his heart, in his heart, he wanted to create a greater Russia. He wanted to bring back the Soviet Union with some modifications in his heart. But what was in his head? What was he really thinking and saying? He's made it clear, in my opinion, that he did not think that this was feasible. And furthermore, there is no evidence that he was planning. There's no evidence that he was planning to create a greater Russia that was something like the former Soviet Union. And that's in large part because he didn't have the capabilities. Barry and Stephen Morrow have gone over this in considerable detail. This is a country that has a GNP the size of Texas. I mean, come on. Do you really think that the Soviet Union is coming back and is going to be on the beaches of Dunkirk in 48 hours, like we used to worry about during the Cold War? This is not serious, right? Again, it was NATO that was moving, not the Russians that were moving west. And if you look at the military operations in Ukraine, this does not look like a campaign to me that's designed to conquer all of Ukraine. People talk about a blitzkrieg. This ain't a blitzkrieg. I don't see any panzer divisions racing across the country. When I run a blitzkrieg, the thing I do is go around obstacles. I go around the obstacles and I avoid cities. I get out in the open plains and I run those panzer divisions as fast as I can. And I conquer the whole country. It doesn't look to me like that's what's happening in Ukraine. No evidence that he plans to incorporate all of Ukraine into a greater Russia. So I think that you folks were wrong in two very important ways. One is you didn't understand that you were dealing with imperial America, that the Steve Brookses and Bill Wolforths of the world and the John Eikenberries of the world had won, right? And, and, and their arguments had deep roots, right? And furthermore, you greatly overrated, you greatly overrated the Russian threat because you needed a threat to keep us there, right? And you greatly overrated the Russian threat. So the bottom line is, where are we today? Well, the good news for you is we're there forever, right? You should really be happy about that. We're there forever. The bad news for you is we're in a major war, right? NATO's not directly involved yet, but they're mighty close. We might get sucked in. And by the way, nuclear weapons might be used. Have you thought about that? I've thought about that. This is what your policies have led to. Uh, this is not a happy story. And I would just say, if we had won the debate, and there was no chance of that again, I want you to understand, we didn't stand a fighting chance. But if we had won, there'd be no war today. Crimea would be part of Ukraine. The Donbass would be part of Ukraine. It would not be a perfect world. But in my humble opinion, it would be a hell of a lot better world than we have because your ideas and Steve's ideas have been implemented and have won the day. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, we're going to move back directly to Marina, hoping that the IT issues are solved. Marina, can you hear us? No, we can't hear you. Marina. Hugo, you should respond to us, you know, and then sure. if Marina comes in, we can go to Marina. Yes. So, well, first of all, thanks a lot for all these uh, inputs. This was extremely interesting. And I think it's very important to, to have this conversation because it's really a crucial topic for the future of European security and for transatlantic relations. Um, a couple of points. First of all, I do believe that the restrained scholars continue to be highly optimistic and overly optimistic about the capacity of Europeans to defend themselves without the US. Um, again, strategic cacophony remains a constraint. Sure, it must be updated because the threat environment has evolved. 
clearly, when the strategic environment evolves, threat perceptions change. And this European threat perceptions evolved in the 1990s and in the 2000s, 2014, they changed. And again, in February 2022. So this is not surprising. It doesn't mean that the divergences in priorities, prioritizations and perceptions continue. And again, the profound shortfalls that Europeans have and the range of capabilities that it should de develop if the US pulls out means replacing essentially 70 to 80 percent of the capabilities within NATO, which includes capabilities that take a very long time to develop, like C4ISR and others. And so these constraints have not disappeared. Um, now, what I, I personally would be more interested in is thinking of ways of instead of sticking to contending views, which honestly, at this stage, we all know our respective positions on this, is how can we collectively move forward in scholarly debate? And there's one point on which I think we all agree, which is that Europeans can and probably should do more. Uh, but the key questions in, in what areas can the Europeans realistically, given the existing constraints, do more? Um, one thing which is not entirely clear to me is that when I read um, articles and books by restrained scholars, it's not always clear if you guys and the other restrained scholars want a full withdrawal or a partial withdrawal or starting with a partial withdrawal in order to um, achieve a full withdrawal in the longer term. In your article, uh, Steve, uh, you first say in your article in Foreign Policy, recent article, you, for instance, you first say that Russia should... Um, the Europeans should handle Russia on their own, but then you also say that the Europeans should have primary responsibility for their defense. And so, in general, um, it's not entirely clear to me if it's a full withdrawal or partial withdrawal. Barry, for instance, and I think it was an interesting article proposed in 2021 in an article in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, that the remain so it's basically a partial withdrawal. Is the, the US should remain in NATO but continue to provide offensive nuclear forces and naval power and intelligence. But Barry suggests the US should withdraw its conventional land capabilities, which would become the purview of Europeans. Now, in my view, this would not solve the two constraints I discussed before, but it's an interesting debate to have. And with Steve, we are actually, Steve Brooks, we are actually working on a follow-up article in which we are thinking about what areas can, what capabilities can European develop realistically, given the above constraints, in order to do more? And I think that, so in some areas, um, and I'd love to open this conversation with you, uh, again, going beyond this entrenched contending views, for instance, the US could continue to provide um, capabilities in certain niche roles. The US has a clear inherent advantage in certain areas because it can solve collective action problems. It has capabilities that it would be very difficult, costly, and uh, take a long time for Europeans to develop. So the US could continue to provide nuclear weapons, command and control, C4ISR, for instance, because it already has these capabilities and they're very expensive and take very long time to develop. And then the question becomes, what can Europeans realistically do more? And a set of criteria that we could discuss, for instance, is this could be capabilities that would take a short term to develop, say five years, this is just an example. They should be valuable for the US and to strengthen the, the, the transatlantic relationship, but they should also be useful if the US pulls back. And so this is just an idea, but I'm really uh, putting in the conversation the suggestion that would be really interesting and maybe more useful to think of areas in which Europeans can and should do more realistically in light of the persisting, even if, if a change, constraints of strategic cacophony and severe capacity shortfalls. So um, I suggest that we, we take the same order as before. So Steve, if you want to go first. Sure, I'll, I'll try to be very brief. Uh, just three quick comments, uh, reaction to various things that were said all, all around. I mean, first, one argument against you know, sort of Barry, John, and me would be that, well, okay, this hasn't gone well for Russia in Ukraine, but they'll learn. They'll get better. Uh, don't discount them. Um, I think I'm uh, more skeptical about that possibility because I think the problems are more structural, right? It's not just that they had a couple of bad planners. Uh, this is endemic to the way in which the 
Russian society is organized and the Russian military is organized. Again, my reference to Caitlin Talmadge's work uh, here has informed me a lot. Uh, so if the system's inherently screwed up, uh, you know, they could get better, but not to, they're not suddenly going to be 10 feet tall five years from now, having learned uh, from Ukraine. Um, second, there is this genuine question of, well, what happens after this crisis is over? Uh, is Europe sort of going to go back to its old ways? Uh, you know, will we see the reemergence of strategic cacophony? And there, I think there really is kind of a, a paradox. Um, you know, if the external threat is modest, yes, uh, then you don't need that much unity in Europe to have uh, defense capabilities that can keep the continent safe. You only need a lot of unity if there is a big external threat. And what I think we've seen is, is when those external threats appear to be there, the unity uh, suddenly uh, reemerges. Um, that's not an automatic process, but I think it is really uh, it is sort of it's quite instructive how quickly uh, quickly this happened. Uh, and remember, all of Europe doesn't have to agree that Russia is the number one priority forever. Just enough of Europe has to agree that it's enough of a problem that they devote enough effort to it, the same way they have to devote some effort to dealing with problems in the Mediterranean, even though Norway doesn't worry that much about uh, the Mediterranean uh, as well. Uh, and then finally, uh, I think Hugo's last point about you know, how one thinks about this going forward is right. And, you know, what I've called for is an, a new division of labor and exactly what that division of labor looks like ought to be worked out uh, cooperatively between the Europeans and the Americans. I think it ought to be capabilities based, not based on, you know, percentages of GDP, which is politically convenient to negotiate, but doesn't necessarily tell you very much. Uh, Greece looks really good on a percentage of GDP basis because they spend a lot of money on pensions for their officer corps. Uh, that's not what we're interested in here. Um, just a couple of points, though. You know, autonomy uh, does mean that you can't really be dependent on the United States for absolutely critical things. Right. In other words, you can't sort of say, well, we'll provide a bunch of ground forces, but all of our strategic intelligence and reconnaissance satellites and things like that, that we're going to have to get from the United States. And the problem with that, of course, is what if the United States decides not to provide it? It's just like being dependent on uh, Russian oil and gas. Uh, I am more optimistic about Europe's ability to develop those capabilities than you guys are. But that's why you have to have a conversation about it. Um, and I also just one little reminder, uh, Europe does have nuclear weapons. It doesn't necessarily need the American strategic umbrella. Britain and France have their own nuclear deterrence. And that's relevant, not just for their own home territory, because a big war in Europe would inevitably involve those in people's calculations. Steve, Barry? Hugo, can I can I come in at one point because I actually yeah. hear you? Yes. Um, if, if, but if, I, if you Marina, know, I turn it on, is on because I think it makes yeah. like the, the, the my then we can uh, now, Marina. connection. A if Marina is if Marina is connected, can we hear from her now? Because I really was disappointed that I didn't hear the rest of what she yes. had to say. And you guys know my rap on this. I, I kind of would like to hear from her. So Barry, you don't have me. your audio on. My my, my my mic is on. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you, Barry. My mic is on. It is. Yeah. I'm saying, I, let, let's hear from Marina. I exactly. think Barry's talk, Before it's Barry's your... talking, but he doesn't have his audio on. Okay. He does. <laughs> he, he does. Marina, the floor is yours. Okay. Okay, I will go ahead and just uh, uh, talk and, uh, you know, you interrupt me um, if I, uh, you know, uh, if it stops again. I think it's really a question of that platform, by the way. I've heard other um, issues with this uh, ISA, I think. But anyway, you know, so uh, I don't know where, you know, like uh, my, my first intervention stopped where I then, you know, got kicked out of the system. But uh, I will, you know, like maybe start from a different angle because I, you know, like the, the question I would like to bring into the discussion is like, so what are the strategic discussions right now in Berlin going forward? 
Um, and of course, there is one big uh, camp in Berlin that says we double down on the United States, right? And truth to be told, there's also a lot of U.S. lobbying right now. So um, the F-35 deal uh, was also very much used by um, a lot of uh, lobbyists who said like these air airplanes are ready. Um, they're, you know, you can buy off the shelf and, you know, like Berlin is full of uh, all sorts of uh, American uh, lobbyists, um, you know, trying to sell that stuff. Uh, so, you know, it's not just that, you know, like that there's like a, a demand side, there's also a supply side and there's a political, uh, you know, um, movement to this. So this is one option. So, yes, you have uh, a strong, uh, you know, German group that says we double down on the transatlantic relationship. But and I think that's very important to know, there's also a very strong camp in Germany that says we cannot double down on uh, the transatlantic relationship. And so who are these people? On the one hand, it's uh, those former pro, uh, you know, Putin uh, supporters who have still a slight anti-American hinge to their thinking. Still, again, going back to uh, the Iraq war. Uh, so it's actually, you know, like for them, this entire uh, group that was so, you know, like Putin will never do this now is not saying, you know, hallelujah, America is back. But it's actually saying we need to find a different solution. And this solution, you know, like still is a little bit unclear, but it would involve some sort of European strategic autonomy, very close cooperation with the with the French. Uh, like also even, you know, again, like you have in these, uh, uh, you know, informal discussions, of course, again, the nuclear question and so forth. And then there is the second question, or the third camp, I should say, third camp, which, you know, develops a, a European or like a German version of restraint. Uh, and this is, you know, I don't know if you heard this, but that's actually the entire Iron Dome discussion. I, I hope you heard it. Uh, but Germany is uh, has already... Uh, to at least to my understanding, started conversations with Israel to basically, uh, uh, you know, buy the Iron Dome concept. And here it would be basically saying that Germany tries to protect itself as well from, you know, like uh, these uh, threats. And by the way, John, it's not that they are that they think that there will be a blitzkrieg and that the Russians are uh, taking over Berlin and then go to the Atlantic. It's much more about a military blackmail. Right. So that uh, Russia can just, you know, bomb installations and, you know, and then like really put the German population in an in an in a situation of, of immense fear. Um, so this is the this is the idea. And so they want to be protected from these kind of military blackmail attempt. But I think what is very important in this in this kind of German version of restraint, Germany would not move an inch on China because this is the other big component. Germany trades these days more with China than with the United States. 40% of Volkswagen, uh, the cars, get sold in China. And although, you know, I would say that the pro-Russia camp right now is uh, very much muted, and I think this is this will stay uh, so. I don't see any kind of revival of, you know, like going back to Putin and, and uh, kind of, you know, reestablishing this relationship as long as he's in power. But there is not an automatic questioning then of all of kind of authoritarianism. Um, so, you know, there's a, a big discourse of now like democracies uh, unite and, uh, you know, like and these the, cli the lines are uh, clear cut. I don't see this type of uh, uh, discourse actually in Germany. Right. So like there's still a very strong in particular business lobby. It says, OK, fine. You know, like the relationship with Russia are on ice, but the relationships with China need to be maintained. Uh, and, you know, like, of course, uh, for whatever uh, the United States uh, will do in the future, that's a very important component because basically Germany could carve out, try to carve out also, also this kind of big Switzerland type of neutrality position and just, you know, being neutral and trading with, you know, like everybody they, they want and trying to protect themselves as best as they can, including, because I find this personally quite fascinating, the, the iron uh, dome. Um, okay, so I will, uh, I hope you uh, could un understand what I was saying and I will hand back to uh, Hugo. Great. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Marina. It's very nice to, to hear you. Finally, uh, I'll give the, um, the floor back to Barry. Can everyone hear me? Because I've hit my mic thing properly. John, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I don't, I don't see much point in returning to the, you know, to the, you know, military lessons. I think uh, 
uh, Moro and I both basically caveated what we were saying by saying, look, the fog of war is still here. Uh, but I think the observations that I did make uh, about what we have seen are, 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 basically, um, are basically fair. Uh, I, I just want to, I guess I have two, I, I guess I have a question for Hugo, which I consider to be a methodological question. And then I have a, an analytic question. And we can, we can come back to the methodological question, right? Um, I found the whole development of the idea of European cacophony based upon elite interviews to be a suspect method because most of the security policy people in Europe share a consensus view and that in public relations is central to the strategy of the Europeans to pass the buck to the United States. So I simply do not believe that you can get an honest, reliable, useful answer from that method. And I wonder how you judge, and I'll put it in simple terms, when people are essentially spinning you. How, how do you know, right? So that's, that's point one. I found that whole part of the argument to be unpersuasive on, on its foundational elements. In other words, it was built on a foundation that I found very, very suspect, right? So it's point one. Point two, and I, I think, you know, in, in, the, in, in the piece, I think that there's some squishiness in your argument about what the standard is and who is autonomous, right? So in the piece, I couldn't tell whether you were judging Europe as a potential global superpower against U.S. standards, a potential global superpower capable of interventions around the world, uh, its potential capability to deter the Russians, its potential capability literally to compete with the United States. I couldn't tell what the standard was, right? And in my piece, and in my discussion a few minutes ago, I premised it on deal with the Russians, right? So these are these are different standards, and I'm not sure what the standard was. And similarly, I'm not sure what the unit of analysis is. In other words, so, in, in, you know, because I was dealing with the ISS piece and your piece at the same time, right? Your piece basically is following the, the line of European Union strategic autonomy. That's one path to strategic autonomy. Another path to strategic autonomy is European states in and out of the Union, to include Britain, in a military coalition that's NATO minus the United States, a conventional alliance. And European Union efforts towards strategic autonomy would obviously be a contributor to that alliance but not necessarily the only one, right? So two questions here on that score. What's the unit of account and what's the standard, right? So for me, if Russia is the standard and a, NA a European military coalition minus the U.S. is the unit of account, that takes you in one direction. If it's the European Union competing on the global stage, that takes you in a different direction. Right. So I just thought I would put those arguments on the table. And then finally, I'll just confess my own, you know, I'm not really ambivalent. I want I, I want a totally different security relationship with Europe. I, I would like to see a transatlantic alliance. It's a transatlantic alliance of of between the United States and the European Union, not the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, a traditional bilateral alliance. And America's military support would be conditional on the moment. Right. That that's the kind of alliance that I would like with an entirely autonomous European security structure. I don't care who has the flag. Right. But, but that's what I would like to see. But given my recognition of John's you know, statement, which I think to be true and is going to be even more true now that U.S. forces are strung out like bees along NATO's eastern um, eastern flank. All, all I can hope for now is 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 better burden sharing. Right. And I, I will continue to write articles on burden sharing because I would like to see better burden sharing in this structure. But I still don't like this structure. I, I would I would prefer a, a very different one. 
And I'll reply to your question later, but I first want to give the floor to um, Mauro. Uh, very quickly, I think just two general points. Mauro, we can hear you. The mic is not on. I heard him. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry, I got distracted. Uh, so very quickly, one aspect that to me is actually, I think, very. Mauro, your mic is not on We because we can't hear you. I, I can hear him fine. Oh, really? So the IT systems clearly has problems because I can't hear Mauro either. Looks like Barry can't either. And I can't hear Barry. I can't I can hear him. I can't hear him. Yeah. Okay. Uh, ah, sorry. No. I'll, yes. I'll go ahead and uh, I'll keep it short. So one discussion, one point that uh, kind of trashed from what we've been discussing so far, but that I want to point out because I think it's relevant to me. Uh, John, you said the U.S. is never going to go away from Europe. Some like me are actually happy because not much for the defense, the military defense itself, but for the fact that uh, I do believe American presence in Europe plays an important role in key decisions specifically towards critical technologies. So we have seen the debate about uh, 5G. There's going to be a similar debate soon about uh, cloud computing. So European countries, like in cloud computing, want to catch up. There's no way they are going to catch up anytime soon with Amazon or the like. And that's where the debate in key countries is going to be heavily skewed by what gover the government perceived to be the stronger ally. And two years ago, China was really making major inroads across Europe, including Switzerland, including uh, Italy, including several other countries. So to me, uh, one way to also think about the current debate, and I remember mm, Barry mentions that American kind of commitment abroad essentially subsidize American uh, corporations, in part, if I didn't understand it, misunderstood it. But to me, there is a key aspect that is, well, for some key technologies, especially communication technologies that have high entry barriers, that have major uh, network effects, the decision in the future is going to be strongly influenced by whether European leaders want to still stick with the US or whether they try to go by themselves, they are likely going to fail. And then they might at one point might choose whoever is going to sell the technology. I'll keep it short with, because we have four minutes, so I don't want to speak more. Yes. Thanks, Mauro. So, indeed, we have four minutes left. Steve, the floor is yours. Oh, John. No, it's me. It, yeah. In the, so, I'll be very quick. One, I have to leave at 9.30 promptly because I have to teach a class. But I, I didn't have much to say anyway. Uh, and the main point I would make is I think your piece has been overtaken by events. We can argue whether you're right or wrong. But... Uh, the fact is, it just doesn't matter anymore. We're there. And not only are we there, we're in the van. We're leading. And I think the big question Europeans want to ask themselves is, how happy are you following the United States? Uh, when I look at American foreign policy leadership, it makes me uh, very nervous. In fact, I have a big knot in my stomach. I don't have the sense that the people who run American foreign policy are first-rate strategists. I'm not even sure they're second-rate strategists, to be honest. It's uh, it's very scary to sort of see these boys and girls in operation. Uh, and <coughs> you, you're, you Europeans, I think, you want to think long and hard about what you've gotten yourself into. You know, think about what you're wishing for here. Because... Uh, there's, a, there's big trouble coming. The consequences of this Ukraine fiasco cannot be underestimated. They're going to be wide and they're going to be deep. And in my opinion, it's the Americans who are principally responsible for creating this mess. And what you, you go and you, Steve, want is you want the United States in the driver's seat and you want the Europeans to be following the Americans. If I were a European, I'd be very, very worried about pursuing that way of thinking about the world. Okay, great. Well, thanks a lot. And I'll reply to some of these points. 
The first one is that there's actually, and this might surprise you, there's a big point of agreement between all of us, which is, as I mentioned in the slides, my personal normative stance is that I want Europeans to be able to defend themselves as soon as possible without the US. Where I think that you are all being overly optimistic is about the prospects of for Europeans to become fully strategically autonomous. And this is where the debate is, in my view, and this is where the debate should move forward in the future. So very briefly, because we're out of time, to reply to various questions. The methods, uh, it's not in only interviews, it's not surveys, as Steve mentioned. It's actually a nested approach, which is based on uh, more than 80 government documents. So it's, it's publication by governments. And then we, based on that, we did the coding. Uh, then we double checked with national specialists for each of these countries, experts. And then for a couple of countries, we had um, we double checked by conducting additional interviews. So it's a nested approach based on primary and secondary sources. Uh, it's funny that you ask about the unit of analysis because this is one question I always wanted to ask you because like in your 2006 articles, you see that the EU uh, is basically can defend itself. And then in other articles, you say it's either just two out of the three major powers. So I think I can turn the question to you. My personal position is pretty clear is the end goal is what I mentioned in the beginning is autonomous defense and deterrence at the conventional nuclear level including vis-a-vis -vis a nuclear armed state. So this is what full strategic autonomy entails. And in the article, we'll look at different types of coalitions, just look at the appendix, and we look at, could they achieve these goals? And the, and the answer is no. But this does not mean it has to stay this way forever. The real question to move, I mean, to ask for the future is, what can Europeans do more realistically? This is it. So, is there anyone who wants to jump in? Maybe we take two more minutes. Uh, yeah. Mauro. Actually, sorry, I have uh, to go. I have another meeting speak about European security. Just let me say thanks to everyone. And uh, not to make advertisement, but Ugo, Marina and I, actually Marina who, and Ugo, and I just joined them, promoted the European SWAMOS to really address these key questions. So let me thank them. And I'm sure you will be happy as well. So sorry, I have to go to another meeting. Thanks a lot for your comments. Thank you. Mark. Anyone want to jump in quickly or? No, I, I think we should uh, wrap it up because my, my guess is everybody has more things to do today. The audio is dead anyway. Somebody killed it. Yeah, I, I think we're, I think the, uh, the tech gods were not our yeah, let friends. Let me uh, say thank you as well. And I'm very sorry about all the trouble here. You know, I don't want to um, blame anything or anyone, but it was good to see you. And Barry, you know, we are very happy that you can join, of course, Euroswamos in uh, June. Looking forward. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. And Bye we hope then. to continue the conversation. All right. Bye.